Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak and to everyone who's tuning in either uh, at this moment or in the future. Uh, so my name is Ralph Morrison. I'm a professor of mathematics at Williams College uh, and I study lots of different areas of mathematics. Some of them are called algebraic geometry. Some of them are called tropical geometry. The stuff I'm gonna tell you about today um, sort of lives in the world of graph theory. Uh, and in particular, uh, it's gonna be about some chip firing games that we can play on these graphs. So I'm not assuming anyone has heard of any of these words before. So I'm gonna start off by telling everybody what I mean when I say uh, a graph. That can mean lots of different things depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and um, from there, I'll sort of you know, emphasize why graphs show up all sorts of places in real life and also why graphs show up in lots of games that we've played before, why these are very natural settings to be thinking about um, playing different games, whether they're solitaire games, games against other people, games with other people. Uh, and then I'll tell you about this family of chip firing games, which are really fun, but also have some beautiful mathematics behind them. Um, so uh, just to get started, uh, what do I mean when I say a graph? Uh, for me, a graph is just a collection of nodes or vertices. Usually I'll call them vertices. Um, if you want to call them nodes, that's fine. Uh, usually I just draw those as little dots. So in this picture, you see uh, eight uh, thick dots. Those are the vertices. Uh, and those dots are going to be connected by edges. Uh, those edges are those thin lines that I've drawn connecting things up right there. Uh, so it's a very simple object, just a bunch of nodes connected up by vertices. Uh, in terms of how you should interpret this, we're going to see lots of examples, um, but think of those vertices as being objects uh, or being people or being locations, being some kind of um, object. Uh, and then edges are going to encode a relationship between those objects. So maybe two objects are related in a certain way, um, precisely when there's an edge connecting them. So there's lots of different things that we'll see that you can encode using graphs. And a really important thing about graphs, which is I think a little bit odd depending on what kind of math you're used to, uh, is that um, we really don't care what the picture of our graph looks like. Uh, we don't care about the geometry of it. All we care about is what is connected to what, uh, namely which dots do we oh, have, uh, namely which dots do we have, uh, and how are they connected to each other. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see another drawing of a graph. It's some nodes connected by edges. You know, those edges don't need to be straight lines. I can draw them curvy if I want. And actually that graph at the bottom of the screen is the exact same graph as the top of the screen. You'll notice that both of them uh, have a total of eight nodes and they're actually connected up in the same way. You've sort of got two pieces, one with these three in a line, and then the other one's sort of forming some kind of diamondy kite-shaped thing. Uh, so even though they're drawn differently, they're actually the same uh, graph, uh, which is a little bit weird because usually if pictures look different, we think they're different mathematically, but here we consider those the same. Uh, I'll also just mention real quickly, different people have different rules for what edges can look like. Uh, so my rule is this, sometimes you could have multiple edges between the same pair of vertices. For example, in this graph here, uh, over on the right side of the graph, we've got um, two uh, edges connecting a pair of vertices. So maybe those are super duper related to each other in some way. Um, I'm not going to allow what are called loops though, and a loop would be if a vertex connected to itself. Uh, sometimes people like to have those, but I don't. So for me, um, it's always just going to be, um, you know, edges with multiple edges allowed. Uh, something that's very important about this graph compared to the previous graph is it's connected, meaning it's all one piece. Uh, if I wanted to start at one vertex and travel to any other vertex, I could do it just by zigzagging along the edges. Whereas on the last slide, that wasn't true. If I started off at one of the three vertices on the right, then I couldn't travel to any of the vertices uh, on the left. So a lot of the graphs we're going to think about are going to be connected. That is, they're all going to be one nice piece. Uh, so a really important thing that I'll try to do justice to over the course of two slides uh, is that graphs are absolutely everywhere in life. They sort of show up very organically and naturally. They're things we take advantage of when we're computing or figuring out um, all sorts of problems. So one very common graph that people think about a lot uh, would be a social network. So uh, a social network would be a graph where the vertices or the objects are people. Uh, so here we've actually drawn uh, each little node as a person. Uh, and you have an edge between two people, maybe if they know each other. Uh, and so this would just be a social network in real life. Who knows who? Uh, you know, do people have a friend in common, even if they don't know each other? You could also, of course, have this on an actual online social network. For instance, uh, maybe you look at everyone on Facebook, so you've got billions and billions of vertices, one for each Facebook user, and you connect up two of them uh, precisely if they're Facebook friends with each other. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's all sorts of questions you might ask, you know, how far apart uh, are people? Is it true that, you know, I can always get from one person to another person in um, uh, six acquaintances or something like that? So studying graphs that come from social networks, that's studying how people interact with each other and things like that. Uh, another important place um, graphs come up would be root maps. Uh, so this graph that I've got right here, sort of overlaid on the United States, uh, has a bunch of vertices. Those correspond to airports. So, you know, I've got an airport in Atlanta, airport in El Paso, airports all over the place. Uh, and they're connected by an edge precisely if, I think this is delta, yeah, it, precisely if delta flies uh, from one airport to the other. Um, and so just looking at this graph, you can already read off important things about how Delta flight works. For instance, you could probably figure out that maybe Atlanta, Detroit, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Salt Lake City look like hubs because they've got lots of edges coming out of them. Um, you might ask questions now like, well, what if, say, Atlanta has to close down because there's a sudden ice storm? Uh, is the graph still connected? Can I still reroute flights so that I can travel everywhere? Uh, by the way, this is one of those examples where maybe having multiple edges would make sense. Uh, for instance, maybe I care that there's more than one flight a day uh, that goes from Salt Lake City to Minneapolis. Because if my flight gets canceled, well, it's great to know that there's another one. In other words, maybe I delete an edge from a flight cancellation, but there's still some edges to get me where I'm going. Um, so this is for, um, you know, air travel, but of course, if you're looking at bus routes or train routes uh, or any kind of public transit, um, there's going to be some sort of graph. For instance, if you look at a map of the New York subway, it's uh, various nodes connected up in certain ways with each other. Um, and even if you're navigating by car, well, maybe you pull out your phone, look at Apple Maps or Google Maps or something like that, um, it's going to have to compute for you the shortest route from point A to point B. And actually, a lot of the mechanics that go into computing that um, are based on graphs, uh, namely finding some kind of shortest path um, uh, from one node to another. Um, so graphs are super important. They come up just in our interactions with people. They come up in the sorts of things that we compute, all sorts of things we study. So hopefully you're convinced that graphs are a very useful, very practical thing. But graphs are also a really fun thing uh, because it turns out that lots of games, board games and otherwise, um, secretly are related to graphs, sometimes in a very strong way, sometimes in a not so obvious way. Uh, so I'm going to show people some probably familiar games uh, and give you maybe slightly less familiar graph theory interpretations of them. Uh, so one of my favorite games growing up was the game of risk. Uh, you've got a big map of the world. It's split up into 42 territories. Everyone puts down uh, their armies and, uh, you know, sort of tries to take over the world. If you take over a continent, you get bonuses, stuff like that. Uh, the important mechanism in the game is if you want to um, have your army attack someone else's army, they have to be in territories that border each other. So for example, Eastern United States and Western United States border each other, so you could have a battle there, but Eastern United States does not border, say, Iceland. So you couldn't have that battle there immediately. And some of the borders uh, are across water, for instance, it looks like between South America and Africa, that counts as a border. Um, and so what that means is that even though this is a very beautiful map and fun and old timey and probably not properly to scale uh, based on what we know about the world now, uh, it doesn't actually matter what those territories look like. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter what shape they are. All that matters is which other territories they border. So if we wanted to, we could actually encode this risk board in a much simpler way. We could have one vertex for every territory and connect two vertices if those territories border each other. And if you were to do that, you would get a graph that looks something like this. So Can I break in with a quick question from sure. one of our participants? Absolutely. Uh, okay, Neil asks, is there any time or time interval connected to edges? For That's example, yeah. Two flights at different times between the same two airports, same edge? That's a good question. So the way I would maybe encode, say we're on this airport map here, the way I might encode having multiple flights uh, is, um, say, in a given day, is to add multiple parallel edges between those. So let me actually hop back. So you'll notice here on this graph, I had uh, two vertices connected by two edges. Those were airports and the edges represented flights. Maybe that means there's two flights per day. Then if you want to keep track of, you know, what's happening at what time, then maybe you give labels to these edges so that they have uh, a time there. Um, so by default, there's not necessarily a time parameter, but you could encode that somehow in this graph, I think. Um, yeah, good question. Cool. Um, so um, 
this, uh, okay, so here we've got a very abstract version uh, of, of the map from RISC. Uh, you'll notice Australia sort of hanging out there in those little green vertices there, and you can double check that indeed the four uh, territories in Australia are connected in this way. Now, personally, I think it's a lot more fun to play on this map because you can actually, you know, think about like geography and have some intuition for what's going on. However, sometimes drawing things really abstractly like this tells you important things about how you might play the game. For instance, anyone who's played before probably knows Australia is really easy to defend. And you can spot that really easily on this graph because you'll notice there's one little vertex in Australia uh, that's the only way out of Australia or into Australia. So if you uh, you know, fortify really heavily there. It's really hard for people to get in. Whereas, for instance, Europe has all sorts of um, uh, other other um, uh, territories bordering it. I think uh, maybe Europe has more, almost more than anyone else. So Europe's actually pretty hard to hold, uh, even though it's smaller than, say, Asia. Uh, so sometimes thinking about these things graph theoretically can highlight features that are actually important for how we play the game. Um, Another board game that's also played on a map of the world might be um, a little bit on the nose for everyone right now is the game of Pandemic. I will argue it's actually a very good game to be playing right now because it is a cooperative game. The big moral of it is if there's a time that, um, you know, some pandemic is spreading through the world, the thing we have to do is all work together and do our part uh, to try to stop it. So I think, uh, especially compared to Risk, where everyone's just fighting each other, Pandemic is, is a good game to be playing right now. Uh, and in fact, the way the uh, board game is designed, uh, or the, the, uh, the board itself, you can see there's a map of the world and there's some cities marked on it. They actually literally draw out the graph of which city can travel to which one. Uh, so Pandemic, similarly to Risk, is secretly being played uh, on a graph, um, but uh, it's a little less secret about the fact it's a graph. Um, so you can actually see um, those sorts of things showing up. And of course, the properties of the graph as it varies over different parts of the world, that's gonna influence uh, how you might wanna play. And in fact, um, if you're a scientist who's studying and modeling the spread of diseases and things like this, graph theory is a very important tool for figuring out, you know, how do things tend to spread? And maybe that's uh, done in conjunction with a social network. If there's, you know, someone who has a whole lot of edges connecting to them, you might worry, oh, maybe, you know, diseases will spread that way. So graph theory can help us uh, not only play board games about pandemics, but also try to solve and study them. Um, so those are sort of similar uh, kinds of examples. One that's a little less obvious of a graph uh, that I also like playing is Sudoku. Um, so Sudoku is a solitaire game. You play it by yourself. You've got this nice nine by nine grid. It's split up into nine three by three grids. And the rules are you have to fill in numbers, uh, one through nine, uh, so that you never have the same number appearing more than once uh, in every row, in every column, and every little three by three square. And in fact, since there's nine things, it's gonna show up exactly once, but you could just say things can't show up more than once. Um, so this is you know, a fun game. You can do some process of elimination, figure out where things are going. It turns out that this game is secretly a game about coloring graphs, which is a topic that mathematicians have been thinking about for a long time, long before uh, Sudoku became popular anyway. Uh, so let me try to convince you that this has something to do with graphs. Um, so given our Sudoku board, we could build a graph that has 81 nodes, one node for every one of these little one by one squares. And all I really care about is making sure that the label, the, the one or the two or the nine that I put on my node, I wanna make sure it's different from all the labels I put on um, the nodes in the same row or column uh, or um, three by three square. So maybe in my graph, I'll take my node corresponding to a square and I'll connect it to all the other nodes that it has to be different from. And so let me show you what that looks like. It would be crazy to draw this uh, nine by nine example. So maybe I'll show you a little four by four example. So you could also play Sudoku on a four by four board, now split up into two by two squares. Um, so uh, I will have 16 nodes in the graph associated to this board. Uh, I've labeled the squares on the board. I've also labeled the um, vertices on the graph the same way. So for example, that one one node uh, corresponding to the one one square in the Sudoku table, there are a total of, I think, seven other squares that it has to be different from. So it has to be different from the three things in its row, the three things in its column, and then there's also one extra thing in its box it has to be different from. Uh, so that means that the one one node gets connected to seven uh, other vertices. Now I'm labeling these with the numbers one, two, three, and four. I could just as easily think of that as the colors um, blue, red, uh, green, and yellow 
So what we're really doing is we're going to try to color in our graph with those four colors such that I never have uh, the same color for two vertices connected by an edge. Uh, that's called a graph coloring with four colors. And again, that's something that's been studied for a very long time. So personally, I think, again, it's sort of funner to play on the Sudoku board itself, probably easier to visually keep track of. Um, but there is this fact that if we know how to solve problems on graphs, um, then we actually know how to solve Sudoku. I have to let my cat out of the room real quick. Bye, cat. Uh, so, Hopefully this convinces you that organically all sorts of uh, games have graphs either embedded in them or that can be associated to them. Um, so I'm now going to introduce uh, to you uh, the family of games I want to tell you about, namely chip firing games on graphs. So here the graphs are going to be readily apparent. Uh, we're going to start with a graph, maybe this um, graph right here. I would like it to be connected. It's just a little bit nicer if everything is one piece. Uh, so I can get from any vertex to any other vertex, traveling along vertices. Um, so maybe this is uh, my graph with seven uh, vertices, and we've got labels on them, P up to V, done alphabetically. And what we're going to do is we're going to place some chips on the vertex of our graphs. So I usually think of these as poker chips. Uh, you could also think of them as computer chips or potato chips, whatever kind of chips you want. Just something that's uh, a nice discrete thing that's maybe representing some value. Uh, so you could think one chip equals one dollar. Um, so, for example, here are some perfectly fine ways that I could place chips on my graph. Uh, so maybe on the one on the left, I've placed two chips on the vertex that I've named P. I'm also allowed to put negative number of chips. So maybe I have red chips that represent debt. Um, so there's say negative eight chips uh, on uh, vertex Q um, and so on. And so I put some chips on all these vertices. Some of these uh, vertices don't have numbers on them. That just means there's zero chips on them. Just to keep things a little cleaner, I won't mention when there's zero chips. Um, and then on the other uh, side of the screen on the right, there's another way we could place chips. So really a chip placement or a chip configuration, which is what I call these things, on the graph uh, is just a way of assigning um, integers, that is whole numbers or possibly negative versions of whole numbers uh, to this graph. So, so far that's nothing too interesting. It's just sort of, I put some stuff on my graph, uh, something that was um, had some numbers going on. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce the sorts of moves that we're gonna have uh, in this game, namely, moves that are going to transform one configuration into a different configuration. And these moves are going to be called chip firing moves. So what does a chip firing move look like? Uh, well, to perform a chip firing move, we're going to choose one vertex in our graph uh, and we're going to fire it. And that means it's going to donate one chip to every one of its neighbors. And more specifically, it'll donate along every edge that it's touching. So if you have multiple edges, you'll donate along uh, each edge. So just as one example, maybe we have this configuration that we had on the previous slide. Maybe I decide I want that upper left vertex, the one with two chips on it, I want that vertex to fire. So what will that do? That will mean that it donates one chip along each of the three edges coming out of it. Now that actually means it'll go into debt because it only has two chips and it's donating three of them, but that's okay. So we perform that chip firing move and we get this new chip configuration, a new placement of chips on our graph. Uh, and you'll notice that um, the chip, the vertex that was fired, that went down by three, uh, and then each of those neighbors of it went up by one. So it's donated uh, some of its chips to its neighbors. So these are the sorts of moves that we're going to be doing in chip firing games to turn one placement into another one. And uh, we don't necessarily want to just do one move. We might want to do lots of moves. So I'm going to introduce uh, a definition, which mathematicians love to do. I'm going to say that two chip configurations are equivalent to each other, that is somehow the same, if they differ by a sequence of chip firing moves. Um, so these two chip configurations up at the top, those are equivalent to each other. I denote that with a little squiggle. It's not quite an equal sign because they look a little different, but somehow they're the same uh, in terms of I can turn one into the other using chip firing moves. Um, but it's perfectly fine for me to do multiple chip firing moves. So for example, uh, if we look at that um, uh, last chip configuration, we might pick that vertex, say, with six chips. It's got a lot of chips to spare. Maybe it should donate some to its friends. So we could take that one and have it chip fire. 
in which case it would go down to three chips from six, and then each of its three neighbors uh, would get an extra chip. Um, and so um, one of them actually has that eliminated, another one goes from minus eight to minus seven, and another goes from zero to one. Um, so I would say that all three of these placements are equivalent to each other, since I can move between them using chip firing moves. So the games I'm going to introduce you to are all about thinking about chip configurations and asking questions about them, uh, namely asking what can we do if we're allowed to move around according to these chip firing moves. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to our very first chip firing game, um, which is going to be a solitaire game. Uh, and what the game says is given a chip configuration, try to eliminate all debt uh, that is present in the graph using these chip firing moves. That is, try to make it so that uh, no one has a negative number of chips. So it doesn't matter how many chip firing moves you have to do that, you just wanna make it so that nobody has a negative number anymore. Of course, maybe, depending on the placement, maybe it's impossible. Maybe no matter how many times you chip fire, you're never actually going to get out of debt. Uh, so if it's not possible, then somehow argue that there's no way to win this game. Now I'm gonna claim that sometimes there's gonna be an obvious way to win or it's gonna be obvious we can't win. So here are two chip placements, I think the very first ones we saw uh, when I was um, introducing those. Um, and I claim that the first one is impossible. And here's my argument for that. Let's look at the total number of chips on the graph. Uh, and of course, we've got some negatives, so negatives are gonna cancel positives. So I've got two plus five minus eight minus one. That ends up being negative two. So in that placement, there's a net total of negative two chips. Now, if I do a chip firing move, I'm not going to change the net total of chips. It might be that, you know, someone goes into debt while someone gets more or vice versa, but the total number is never going to change. It's always going to have uh, a constant of negative two chips uh, if I add up all those chips. And if there's always negative two chips, at least one vertex has to be in debt, no matter what we're doing. Because if everyone was out of debt, I'd add up all those numbers. I couldn't get a negative number like negative two. So there's no way to win with the first one. Um, with the second one, there is a way to win. You can sort of spot it pretty quickly. For example, we could pick that vertex that has nine chips on it uh, and make that fire. So it would donate, I think, a total of five chips, one along every edge that it's touching, um, and it wouldn't go into debt. It has those chips to spare. Uh, and one of those chips would actually cancel out that minus one debt that we have sitting in the graph. So in the first case, we could not win the chip firing game, number one, whereas in the second case, we could win it. Uh, and it was sort of pretty quick to spot in both cases. Sometimes it's not so obvious though. What if we had this chip placement right here? Uh, now, it's maybe possible to do, because if you look at the net uh, total of chips, it's minus one plus one plus one, which equals one. So conceivably, there could be some way to do some chip firing moves, and then maybe after a while, we've got one vertex with one chip and everyone else has zero chips, and then we've won. Um, but if you try to do these chip firing moves, uh, it gets pretty hard uh, because, you know, maybe I try to chip fire one of those vertices with one chip. Well, it'll probably go into debt then. So then I try to chip fire some other vertex to eliminate that debt. Uh, but then who knows, maybe that debt's no longer possible to eliminate. So I would say in that third case, it's not obvious whether we could win or not. Uh, and so that's one of the things that sort of makes this game interesting, that at least in some cases, it's sort of not obvious whether it's doable or not. And if it is doable, how we could find a way to do it. Um, so uh, this chip, fire, uh, chip firing game has been implemented a bunch of times by people. So here are at least two websites where you can play the game. Uh, the first one, uh, I think uh, Debbie messaged out um, to, the, to the chat. So you can probably click that link there. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, then of course you can pause the video and, and type in that web address. Uh, but I think I'll actually switch over to a browser window that uh, has that first link in it, just so I can show you this chip firing game in action. Uh, so uh, switching over to Chrome, I think. Oops, let's see. Uh, let's see, new share, Google Chrome, share that one. Although I can't see it myself right now. Ah, there it is. Great. Okay, so hopefully folks uh, can see uh, this um, chip firing uh, or this little interface. It says choose level and there's levels from one up to 20. 
Uh, and so this is a, um, a chip firing game. So if we go to level one, uh, you can see uh, we've got a little graph here. It's got these three nodes in gray. It's got blue edges. Uh, and there's actually instructions, and those instructions are really just the chip firing game I just told you. So when you click on a circle, uh, it'll chip fire away, uh, and you want to eliminate all the debt. So the first thing that I might try to do is get rid of this minus three that's showing up. That's the debt in the graph. So maybe I'll take this middle vertex and click it a couple times. You can actually see a little anima uh, animation of little coins sliding along there. Uh, and you'll notice every time I fire it, it donates two chips, one along each edge. Uh, so if I want to eliminate that debt, I have to chip fire that one again, which is a bummer because it puts it into debt. But now I'm actually in pretty good shape because you'll notice that this um, vertex that now has three chips on it, if I chip fire it, it only loses one because it only has one uh, edge coming out of it. And so if I chip fire it again, we win. We've gone out of debt. So in this case, we managed to win the chip firing game. And I'll actually maybe skip ahead to a later level to show you a little bit more interesting of one. Uh, so this graph is a little more complicated. There's some cycles showing up in here, uh, which makes things a little trickier. So I'll just sort of fiddle around with it. Um, maybe my general strategy will be trying to move the debt more and more over to the um, right of the picture. So maybe I do some chip firing moves here and here. Uh, some of these go into debt, which is a bummer, but I can move the debt sort of over in this direction. Now that vertex is in debt a whole lot. So maybe I can do some chip firing over here, maybe a little bit over here. And so now um, I'm, I claim I'm very close to winning the game. And here's how I'm actually going to think about it. Um, I'm going to ignore the, uh, the left three vertices and just focus on the, the right triangle of vertices. So um, if I fire one of those vertices with just one chip, it'll go into debt. Uh, I'm going to actually think about firing both of them at the same time. Um, now, of course, I have to fire one than the other. It doesn't matter what order I fire them in, though. So let's say I just fire them both really quickly in whatever order, it doesn't matter. What's gonna happen? Well, they border each other, so one will donate to one and the other will donate to the other. So those cancel out. So if I chip fire them at the same time, then it's like they didn't do anything at all. And so, um, or do anything at all in terms of giving chips to each other. So what that means is that the net effect of me firing those two vert uh, vertices is gonna be each of them will donate one chip to their neighbor that has that minus two right there. Uh, and so that will actually let me win the game. So I chip fire one and chip fire the other, and it does exactly what I was hoping it to do. So sometimes when we're thinking about these um, uh, chip firing games, it's actually a little bit handy to think about firing a lot of vertices at once. Uh, and we'll come back to that as a, as a general strategy. Um, we have another question, Ralph, yeah. if you can take the question. Sure. Neil has a question. After filing a chip, can the subsequent configuration return the graph to the initial configuration? That's a really good question. Um, and we're going to see in a little bit that the answer is yes. Uh, so I sort of, you know, said, oh, we say these configurations are equivalent if I can do chip firing moves to get from one to the other. But can you actually get back to where you started? Um, and in a minute, we're going to see that the answer is yes. Uh, and there's actually a very natural strategy for that. Um, I think that's maybe in two slides. So the next slide, I'm going to tell you one more chip firing game. And then the slide after that will answer uh, or explain why it's possible to undo these chip firing moves. Because yeah, you might worry while playing this game. Oh no, what if I make a mistake? Can I undo it in some way? Yeah. Okay. So that's chip firing game number one. So in theory, I think I'm, I'm back on my slides now, although we'll probably hop back to the chip firing uh, website in a little bit. Um, so let me tell you about chip firing game number two. Uh, so let's say we're given two chip configurations. We might want to know whether they're equivalent or not. That is, whether one of them can be transformed into the other through a sequence of chip firing moves. That's sort of a very natural question based on what we've seen so far. Uh, so, for example, we might ask, are these two configurations we saw at the very beginning equivalent to each other? Now, similarly to the previous game, sometimes uh, it's going to be, quote unquote, obviously impossible. And so here's how I'm going to argue that this is impossible. Namely, you can't turn the first one into the second one. Uh, namely, just look at the total number of chips. You've got negative two chips on the first one, and then I think a grand total of positive 12 chips on the second one. And remember, if I do some chip firing moves, we're never going to change the total number of chips. So there's really no way 
to turn the first one into the second one because chip firing preserves the total number and they have a different number of chips. But like with our first game, there are some times where it's not so obvious. For example, uh, what if we take the same first configuration, but now our second configuration uh, is this one on the bottom right. Um, it has a grand total of negative two chips. So it's conceivable that I could move the chips around on one of them to look like the other. But again, it's not obvious. And maybe I sit down and play around with it for a while. Is there some nice methodical way to do that? Um, and uh, is there some way to tell whether it's impossible? Uh, and we're gonna focus on solving chip firing game number one, just eliminating debt. It's gonna turn out that solving chip firing game number one will help us solve chip firing game number two. Um, but before we solve chip firing game number one, we're gonna need a really important idea, which I alluded to, which is all about simultaneously firing chips. And this is gonna get at this question about how do you undo a chip firing move. Um, so as I alluded to while playing uh, the online game, you can think about firing a bunch of vertices at the same time. Technically, I have to fire them, you know, in some order, but it doesn't really matter what order I do it in. It'll always have the same net effect. Um, so we can fire a bunch of, uh, we can at least think about firing a bunch of vertices simultaneously instead of one at a time. For example, maybe we've got this chip configuration and I decide to fire four vertices all at once, namely the four that I have circled um, in those um, purple bubbles. Um, so, you know, not that doesn't really highlight much for the rightmost vertex. Certainly it's going to lose three chips because it's got three edges coming out of it. The interesting thing to think about, though, is those three chips over on the left, oh, sorry, the three vertices over on the left, because some of them are connected to each other. And what that means is if they're both firing, they're not going to donate anything to each other. They're going to just sort of be neutral with respect to each other. So for example, that vertex that has two chips, normally it would lose three and go down to minus one but two of its neighbors are also firing. So actually that uh, upper left vertex is gonna be going from two chips just down to one chip. So if I fire all of those, this is the net effect uh, of um, how that chip firing move goes. Um, and so when you think about these things sort of all simultaneously, you can see a little bit more structure of, well, if I'm firing this and this, I don't have to worry about some of the details between them. I just have to worry about the other edges coming out of those. And this actually answers this question, namely how we can undo a sequence of chip firing moves. Um, and in particular, all you have to do is, let's say I fired um, some distinct collection of vertices. Uh, all I have to do is fire the other set of vertices to undo everything. So uh, in the top picture, I chip fired four vertices to transform it into a new configuration. In the bottom picture, well, if I take that new configuration and fire the other three vertices, it actually takes me back to where I started. And the intuition for why this should work is, well, what would happen if I fired all of my chips, at, sorry, all of my vertices at once? Well, everything would be canceling out with its neighbors, so firing every vertex at once does nothing. So if I fire some vertices and then fire the other vertices, the net effect is I get back where I started. So you can actually always undo a sequence of chip firing moves. Basically, you just have to fire the set of vertices you didn't fire. Uh, and then you have to do a few details if vertices got fired more than once, but this actually makes sense in terms of being able to undo things. So if you ever get to a spot in the game you really don't like, don't worry, there's some way to get back to where you started, which is quite nice. Okay, so what I'm gonna do over the next two slides is I'm gonna tell you a strategy that actually helps you win chip firing game number one. Uh, this is by no means the only strategy. It's not even necessarily the fastest or the best strategy, but it's one I like a whole lot. Uh, and one of the great things about it is that it always works, so you can think of it as an algorithm. It's something that no matter what the problem is, you can always approach it and you will always get an answer after some finite number of steps. Um, so we're given a chip configuration. We want to check whether or not debt can be eliminated in it. So the first step, and I'm not going to go into too many details about how you do this, we'll see an example in a little bit, uh, is I'm going to force all of the debt onto a single vertex. So uh, in this first example, uh, I had one chip placement. Um, there was debt on multiple vertices. There was a minus two and a minus one. But you'll notice that just by chip firing the minus two vertex, uh, I can eliminate the minus one on the other vertex. So now there's just one vertex. And maybe it has a lot of debt on it, but it's the only vertex in debt. And we'll see on the, on the game in a little bit how you would actually do that. Big idea is you pick your favorite vertex that you want to go into debt, 
have it chip fire a ton of times. It'll like throw a bunch of chips out into the graph. And if there's enough of them, then you can move those around and eliminate all the rest of the debt. So there's some intuitive explanation for that. You can actually prove that it's doable um, and maybe come up with strategies for doing it. Uh, but step one, we're gonna assume all of our debt has been pushed onto one vertex, which we call Q. So Q is the name of our vertex in debt. Then we're gonna use an algorithm that's called DAR's burning algorithm. I think it was developed back in 1990 or something for studying related problems to this. Um, and it's actually gonna help us win the game. So we're going to start a fire at Q. So we're gonna think of ourselves as, you know, taking out a lighter and maybe Q is very, very flammable and so we can light it on fire. And then we're gonna let the fire spread throughout the graph according to certain rules. So Q starts out on fire, maybe the edges incident to Q also catch on fire. Uh, and then once the fire reaches other vertices, maybe they'll burn, maybe they won't. Uh, we'll go through an example and explain the rule for, for how this burning process is going to work. Uh, and it turns out that if the whole graph burns, that uh, means that debt can't be eliminated. So this is a really nice feature of this, um, of this strategy. Namely, we might get the outcome of, oh yeah, there's no way to eliminate debt, which is sort of um, a not obvious thing. Uh, if some of the vertices are unburned, that is if the whole graph doesn't burn, let's chip fire those vertices. It's gonna turn out that we'll be able to chip fire them without introducing any new debt. We'll see in an example why that's the case. Um, so maybe doing that chip firing eliminated debt, in which case we're happy and we win. If not, then we'll go back to step one. We'll again start a fire at our vertex in debt, and then we'll keep on uh, cycling through this process. And it turns out you can prove with some very crafty mathematics that this will eventually terminate. This will um, run in a finite number of steps uh, and will give you your answer. Either here's a way to eliminate the debt or no, eliminating the debt is impossible. So let me show you what that burning process looks like on this example. So we have one vertex that's in debt, that negative five there. We're gonna set that one on fire. I'll represent fire with this orange color here. Uh, so the rule for edges is that edges are basically, you know, super duper flammable. So any edge that's touching a burning vertex, those are gonna burn as well. So now I've got some burning edges that are touching vertices. Here's the rule for how vertices work. Uh, the chips on a vertex can protect it from fires. Uh, you can think of the chip as being like a firefighter on your, um, on your vertex, uh, sort of fighting off the incoming flames. And the rule is that if you have as many chips as there are incoming burning edges, you're safe. You can sort of have one firefighter fighting off each um, incoming flame. But if you have more burning edges than chips, then that vertex is going to burn. So for example, right now, we've got three vertices that we have to check whether they burn or not. Well, one of them is gonna burn, that one that had zero chips because it had one incoming burning edge and no chips to protect it, so that burns. The other two, though, don't burn, right? Because we've got three chips on one, that's enough to protect from one burning edge, same for the one that has um, two chips on it. So those ones are safe for now, but we keep letting the fire spread. Uh, and so since we have a new burning vertex, all of the edges touching that are gonna burn as well. Uh, and so then we've got two new vertices to check. Uh, well, one of them is safe because it has one chip, the other one isn't safe because it has zero chips. Uh, and then more fire spreads, namely the fire that comes out of that vertex. Now I claim at this point in time, um, our process stops. The fire doesn't spread anymore. And you can check that every unburnt vertex has at least as many chips as it has incoming burning edges. Sometimes it's close, like the one, the two, and the one, they're only just barely defending, but they're fine because they have enough chips. Uh, so that means that we've got a collection of unburnt vertices, namely these four right here. And we're going to chip fire those because that's what our process told us to do. It told us to chip fire any unburnt vertices. Uh, and you can actually see in this picture what the net effect of that is going to be. Because of course, if I fire two of those vertices that are both unburnt that are connected by an edge, they're not gonna transmit any um, chips to each other. So if I have a black edge, an unburnt edge, then nothing is going to um, travel along it because both of its vertices were unburnt, so they're both firing. What is gonna happen is that if I have an unburnt black vertex uh, and I have a burning edge coming into it, it'll donate a chip along that burning edge because that burning edge must be coming from a burning vertex, which isn't gonna be doing any chip firing. And because of how we defined our burning process, 
well, we've got some number of burning edges coming in, but we've got at least as many chips, you can donate chips along all of those. So when I perform my chip firing move, I get this configuration, I'm not gonna introduce any new debt. So that's the wonderful thing about this algorithm. At each step, it's still true that the only vertex that's still in debt um, possibly is the starting debt vertex. Maybe we'll eliminate it at some point, maybe we won't, but no new debt is gonna appear. Uh, and you'll notice actually in that process, we did a little bit better. We had minus five debt there now, uh, before, and now we have minus three debt. So we've started to sort of move chips towards that debt vertex, which is really nice. We haven't eliminated debt though, so we have to run through the process again. Uh, so we light that um, vertex on fire again, let the fire spread, uh, that vertex with no chips burns, more things spread, uh, another um, couple vertices burn because they have no chips, uh, and then we get more edges burning. Now here's where things get interesting. Um, we've got a few vertices with chips on them that are now going to burn. You'll notice those two vertices that have one chip each, there are two burning edges coming in, and they can fight off one burning edge but not two. So those are going to catch on fire, and that means the edges touching them catch on fire, and now that last unburnt vertex only has three chips, but it's got four incoming fires. So it's also going to burn. And so what the algorithm actually tells us is that in this case, debt can't be eliminated. So what this burning process is really doing is it's trying to find a collection of vertices that you can chip fire without introducing new debt to try to move chips towards whichever vertex is in debt. And uh, if at any point there just isn't any way to do that, there's no way to sort of progress, then the whole graph is going to burn. Um, and then we're gonna know that the game is impossible. Now there's lots of things we would actually have to prove. We would have to prove that if the whole graph burns, it really is gonna be impossible, uh, that there isn't secretly some way to do it. Uh, we'd also have to prove that if the whole graph doesn't burn, eventually this is gonna terminate. Eventually we really will get rid of that debt. But it turns out you can argue all of those things. So I'd like to maybe hop back over into the Chrome uh, window with uh, our little game right here. So let me show you what that burning algorithm might look like uh, on a pretty complicated graph right here. So I can pick any vertex I want uh, to go into debt. Uh, it doesn't even have to be in debt to begin with. So for example, maybe I pick that vertex that has zero chips on it and I just decide that's where I want all my debt to be. So first I have to make sure all the debt is there. So maybe I chip fire it a bunch of times, start sending a bunch of chips out into the graph. And then uh, there's more debt that's not eliminating, but maybe there's enough chips for me to get rid of that. Okay, cool. So I sort of fired that one vertex a bunch of times um, and then um, managed to get all the debt gone in the graph. You can always do that. So now we would try to run this burning process. So we'd set that um, vertex with negative 16 chips on fire. The two edges coming out of it would burn, but then the fire would stop because that two chip and that 12 chip vertex are perfectly safe. So what would the algorithm tell us to do? The algorithm would tell us that we need to fire all of the unburnt vertices, that is every single vertex um, besides our one in debt. So we go through, fire all of those vertices. You'll notice occasionally I get some intermediate debt, but then it all cancels out when I'm done with my move. Then we run the burning process again. Same sort of thing happens. Uh, I think uh, nothing burns besides the one vertex. So you fire absolutely everything like so. Things are gonna get a little more interesting this next time. If we run the burning process, all of those zero vertices, uh, the flame's actually gonna spread through all of those. So I claim that the only three unburnt vertices are the one, the three, and the 10 that are floating around. Um, so our algorithm says fire those three, so I'll fire those three. Uh, a little bit more debt went down and I also moved some more chips over in this direction. So you can keep running through this process over and over. I won't uh, do it uh, any more times here just because it probably gets a little boring watching me do it again and again and again. But I encourage you to uh, visit this website and try this algorithm and convince yourself that it really is uh, going to work. And one of the wonderful things is that if it's not going to work, then you're gonna get something like we got in these slides where the whole graph burns. And a fun thing that I discovered after I assigned some of my students, hey, figure out how to beat, you know, this level in that game, there is one unwinnable level in that game. And you can actually detect that that is unwinnable using this algorithm here. So we now have a way to win chip firing game number one using this nice burning process. It's not the only way to win the game though. There's other strategies you might try. I encourage you to try to find some of those. You'll notice that you know, it was a little clumsy the way I was playing, you know, uh, making one vertex go way, way, way into debt. Maybe there are more efficient ways 
to try. Um, but this is at least one way you could win chip firing game number one. So how about chip firing game number two? So remember, we were asking, hey, are these two configurations equivalent? It's not super obvious. They have negative two chips total. So maybe, maybe I can move one into the other. Well, here's the idea I'm going to use to try to win or at least determine if this game can be won. Um, and I'm going to take a very simple idea from arithmetic. So let's say I have two numbers, x and y, and I want to know whether x and y are equal to each other. Well, I could look at the difference x minus y. I could subtract y from x. If I do that and I get out zero, that means they were the same thing, right? If x minus y is zero, then x has to equal y. And if it's not zero, then they must um, actually have been different from each other. So I'm going to try to apply the same idea here. Uh, I'm going to try to somehow subtract one of these chip configurations from the other. Now, it's not at all obvious what subtraction should mean here. Uh, and really, the only thing I can think to try is this. Maybe I just go vertex by vertex and look at the number of chips on the first one and subtract the number of chips on the second one. So, for example, on the upper left vertex, I've got two chips in one and one chip in the other. So I put two minus one chips in the subtracted configuration. And then on the lower right, I've got zero chips on one and negative five on the other. So I do zero minus minus five or zero plus five um, on, the, on the subtracted divisor, or sorry, subtracted configuration. And we would end up getting something that looks like this. So all I've done is looked vertex by vertex, subtracted the number that I had on the first one, or sorry, taken the number on the first one and subtracted the number I had on the same vertex on the second one. And I get out this new configuration. Uh, and you'll notice that we had minus two chips on the first one, minus two chips on the second one. After subtracting, we're going to have a net total of zero chips. Those things have sort of canceled out. So if they actually have the same number of chips, which is the only interesting case, then after I subtract them in this way, there's a total of zero chips. So now I'm going to play a ganality game number, sorry, that should say chip firing game. Ganality is a fancy word. That should just say chip firing game number one. Uh, so I'm going to play chip firing game number one. And sorry, yeah, ganality in the title two should also be chip firing. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to play on that on this new configuration. Uh, and so I'll just check whether or not debt can be eliminated. Uh, so why would I do that? Well, we can win chip firing game number one if and only if the debt can be eliminated. That's what chip firing game number one is. Well, if debt is eliminated and I've got a total of zero chips, then that means every single vertex must wind up with exactly zero chips on it. Because if there's zero chips total and one chip has a positive number, there would have to be a negative number somewhere to cancel it out. So the game is winnable if and only if debt can be eliminated, if and only if it's equivalent to the all zero placement uh, of chips. And it turns out that in that case, we've subtracted two divisor, uh, sorry, two configurations and gotten out um, something that's like zero, the all zero placement. Uh, and that's kind of like if I did x minus y equals zero, you can actually prove that um, their difference is equivalent to the all zero placement, if and only if the starting configurations were equal. And in fact, whatever sequence of chip firing moves you do to make that difference turn into the zero configuration, uh, the exact same one would have transformed one of those configurations into the other. So secretly, once we know how to solve chip firing game number one, chip firing game number two uh, is also something we can solve, which is kind of remarkable. Um, so we've, we've figured out these two games to some extent. We have wi strategies to win or tell that winning is impossible. Um, but that doesn't mean we know everything about these games. Sometimes we might want to know, hey, if I just glance at it and don't want to run this whole burning algorithm, uh, can I tell that it's impossible to win or maybe that I'm guaranteed to win? Uh, so let me pose this question. Uh, if there are enough chips on the graph, are we going to be guaranteed to win chip firing game number one? Maybe no matter how those chips are placed. So for example, uh, maybe I put a ton of chips on my graph. And if you add up all these numbers, I think there's something like 72 chips, uh, positive 72 chips total. So some vertices are way in depth, but the total number of chips and the positive outweighs the negative. So uh, is it true that with a lot of uh, net total of chips, there's going to be some way to do a chip firing um, sequence of moves to get the debt eliminated? Turns out the answer is yes. Uh, and it has to do with a very special number 
uh, which we can compute easily for any graph. Uh, so uh, I'm going to call this number g. You can think g for graph. Uh, it's just going to be equal to the number of edges minus the number of vertices plus one. So for example, in this graph, there are 12 edges connecting things up. There are seven vertices or nodes, and 12 minus seven plus one is equal to six. So g happens to be equal to six for this graph. Given any graph, you can compute um, the number g associated to it. And there's a very beautiful theorem, which was proved, I think, in most of our lifetimes. Sorry uh, to any 11-year-olds watching right now. Um, proved by Matt Baker and Sergey Norin in 2008 that says, if there are g or more chips total on the graph, then we can always win chip firing game number one, no matter how those things are placed. So in that configuration above with a total of 72 chips, we will definitely win because remember G was six for that graph. Uh, and so with more than six uh, chips, you're absolutely guaranteed to win. So if you run that burning process, you'll definitely eliminate that debt. And of course you might wonder, is this the best we can do? You know, is that also true if we put um, any arrangement that has at least five chips on the graph? And it turns out that they proved, no, this G is kind of sharp. If there are G minus one chips or fewer, then there do exist placements that are unwinnable. So there's some way to place a net total of five chips on that graph such that there's no way to win the dollar game. Um, and so this gives us some measurement about when the game is easy or hard. Uh, because if you have G chips or more total, then you know you're going to win. If it's fewer, then it's more interesting. Then you don't know what's going on. So this is the sort of theorem that mathematicians love to prove about games in terms of measuring how hard or easy they are to win. And you might wonder why the heck would mathematicians guess that some answer like this might be out there? It's sort of a nice thing to hope for, but where would the inspiration for this come from? Uh, and I might take a one minute digression to just mention that the inspiration that those um, authors had for their theorem comes from the world of algebraic geometry which is a completely different area of math from graph theory. It studies solution sets to polynomial equations. So you may be familiar with equations like y equals mx plus b, which defines a line, or x squared plus y squared equals one, which defines a circle. In general, anytime you look at an equation like that, variables multiplied and added together, set equal to some other stuff, that's defining um, uh, the sort of object that algebraic geometers study. Uh, and so, for example, maybe you get a beautiful set like this one in three dimensions. And it turns out that chip firing games on graphs, this very combinatorial thing that you already know how to win lots of games for, they actually mirror the study of a subject in algebraic geometry called algebraic curves, which are a very rich uh, and classical area of mathematics. And in fact, the connection between them is so strong that sometimes we can prove theorems in algebraic geometry by studying chip firing games. So just by figuring out the right sorts of strategies to win these games, you might prove a theorem that's been open since the 1800s or something like that, which is sort of remarkable. And one of the great things about mathematics that often you have two completely disparate seeming fields and one can actually be used to help you understand the other, um, which I like a lot. And it turns out that there's a theorem in algebraic geometry that looks like that theorem on the last slide. Uh, and so that was why they had some intuition for that. So we've got a couple minutes left. So I do very briefly want to introduce you to a third chip firing game. We won't have time to talk about how to win it, but it's a pretty fun game anyway. Um, so this is chip firing game number three. And it's probably the one that's near and dearest to my heart. It's the one I've done the most research on. So this is the first chip firing game that's for two players. And here's how it works. Player number one is going to place K chips for some number K, maybe K equals five. Uh, they're going to place k chips on a graph G, and let's say they don't put any negative numbers down. So maybe they give uh, one chip, one chip, one chip, and two chips to four of the vertices. So they won't do like six and negative one. Then player two is going to counter their move by putting minus one chips on the graph. And they're probably going to pick a vertex that doesn't have any chips on it, so then one vertex is now in debt. And then player one is essentially going to play our very first chip firing game. They're going to try to eliminate all the debt. Um, on the resulting placement of chips. And if player one can eliminate the debt, they're going to win. And if not, player two wins. So let's do a very concrete example. Maybe we have our favorite graph uh, and player one's allowed to place five chips. Maybe they happen to place them like this. And then player two puts a minus one uh, on that um, vertex uh, on the bottom right there. Well, at this point, player one is going to try to eliminate all the debt. Uh, it turns out that they can. 
Uh, you can run, for instance, Dara's burning algorithm, um, and actually chip firing everything besides that minus one vertex will eliminate the debt without introducing any new debt. Uh, so player one wins in this case. Uh, and in fact, no matter where player two had placed uh, that minus one, player two would have, uh, sorry, player one could have won. Uh, and so player one picked a very good way of placing um, those chips. But there's something very important in this game, namely that player one got to have five chips. Because if they had fewer chips, who knows? Maybe they couldn't have won the game. And in fact, if they have very few chips, for instance, if they get to play zero chips, well, then they definitely lose because there's zero chips on the graph, the opponent puts a minus one, there's no way to eliminate debt because there's a total of negative one chips. On the other hand, if the player gets to place, let's say, G plus one chips, where G was that fancy number from a few slides ago, in this case, that's G equals seven, they're definitely gonna win because even after the opponent takes away one chip, there's G chips left. And we already said, oh yeah, you're gonna always win if there's that many chips. So a natural question is this, given a graph, what's the smallest number K of chips so that player one has a winning strategy? So in this case, for this graph, having five chips, player one did have a winning strategy, in particular the strategy they played. But is that the smallest number of chips? For instance, what if they had four chips? Is there some way to place those and win? What about three chips? So solving this question is actually pretty hard because you have to argue not only that here's a winning strategy for player one, you then have to argue there's absolutely no possible um, better strategy that uses fewer chips. And so trying to figure out that minimum K is a very hard question. I've written a good number of papers on trying to solve it. Uh, I'll just close by mentioning a few cases where we knew it, know it and where we don't. So where are the graphs where we know the minimum K, the minimum number of chips player one needs in order to win this game? Um, it turns out if your graph is a tree that is, doesn't have any cycles, we know you only need one chip to win, which is fun. If it looks like a cycle, uh, that is if it's a big circle of vertices, you can't win with one chip, but you can win with two. Um, we also know what's going on if you've got a complete graph, so everything's connected to everything, complete bipartite graphs where you've got two groups of vertices, everything on the top is connected to everything on the bottom. Uh, if you've got a graph that looks like a two-dimensional grid, like the one pictured here, we know the best strategy. Uh, and even if you have a wheel graph, which is like a cycle with one little vertex in the middle with a bunch of spokes coming out of it, uh, we know the optimal strategies for all of those cases. But there's some very nice families of graphs where we don't know the minimum K. And so here are a few examples of very natural families of graphs where we don't know what the best strategy for player one is. Um, so if you look at a three-dimensional grid graph, so 2D grids stacked on top of each other, maybe with a few vertical lines, we have a guess for the best strategy, but we don't know for sure that it's the best possible. Another nice family are the family of hypercube graphs. Uh, so um, this is a family of graphs that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You've got the first one, which looks kind of like a square. The second one looks kind of like a cube. And in order to get one graph from the previous one, you just take two copies of the previous graph and connect them up. So that third picture kind of looks like two cube graphs. And then you connect those um, matching vertices with the dotted uh, edges that we've shown there. We think we know the best ways of playing that game, but we have not proven it. We do not know for sure how few chips player one can play with. So even in the case of these very nice, simple, fun, intuitive games, there's lots of open mathematical questions that we don't know the answers to. Um, so I'll close just by saying thank you. And I'll also mention that um, I've done, uh, most of the research I've done in chip firing games was actually with a group of students that I worked with back in summer of 2018. Uh, Teresa Yu, Julie Yuan, Franny Dean, Ivan Adun, and Sammy Rosofsky. Um, this was part of the small RU at Williams. Uh, if you're interested in hearing about the sort of research you can do on these chip firing games, um, here's a couple papers we wrote. So thanks very much. <laughs>